Please make your way back to your seat. We're about to talk, um, start the first session. Welcome back. Um, this session will be live streaming, so um, we'll be on live stream, and um, we are just about to introduce um, our speaker for today, um, for this session and the next session. Um, is everyone back inside now? Great. So welcome back. Um, hope you enjoy your coffee, your cake, etc., tea. Um, you, we are now live stream, and um, I'm just going to introduce our speaker, John. I'll just give you a little rundown on John. Our great rundown on John. He's an amazing teacher. I like that word. They said it to me when I was in production, amazing. John is a major blessing. He's a major blessing in the kingdom. John and Sue have been inspired so many of us, but I'm speaking about my personal self. They have imparted and inspired me so much. Not only that, but he watered the word that he sowed. This is the beauty about the word, the seed. You water it. He always have a word of encouragement on his lips, always in season. It's like the Lord know exactly the right time when we meet that John gave me that golden nugget, straight from the throne room. You know, when this is what I tell you, God speaks through us, and he speaks through John. John live the word that he speaks. I know that. He's a man of integrity. I know that. I've observed it over four years been here. And John and Sue, they're just wonderful, loving, and caring. As you can see, John said he's a pastor over in Scotland, and that pastoral heart, that's the heart that we all must eliminate. You know, sometimes when the Lord put a godly person in our, in our midst, we copy the good things. Well, this is the fruit that the Lord has produced for us to partake of. So I'm encouraging you, heat as much, draw as much as you can from John, because there's a lot going to be imparted to you over these next two sessions. And I just want to tell you that when I said to the Lord this morning, what am I going to say when I'm calling up? And he said, John is my son. He live me. He live my word. And I'm just going to call John up now and um, allow him to, play, to release to you the message that the Lord has given him to deliver. Because he's a man he hears, and what he hears the Father, he releases it to you. Bless you, John. Thank you, Ken. Oh, well, hallelujah. Well, hallelujah. hallelujah. I'm awake. Come on, keep up. We've only got 50 minutes, 45 minutes. Ken took five minutes of my time there. <laughs> Hallelujah. It is a blessing, truly, to be standing before you. It is a blessing to be invited. It is a blessing to be asked. This is what I love to do. I'm not so keen on the administration, not so keen on the overseeing of things. This is what I love to do. How are you doing, Bob? Mary? Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. This, I first met Bob and Mary two years ago, and you'll get to know me that if you don't want me to tell anything about you, then don't tell me anything, because I don't know, I just happened to pick on Bob, who was sitting round about here, 
And I got his name and it was Bob, Bob, Bob. And he, he looked at me and he says, well, everybody knows my name now, don't they? So this was Bob's quiet introduction to this ministry. You, Amen. You're more than welcome. So I just love seeing faces that we have journeyed with. We're really looking forward to journeying with the first years because you're all new. The second years, who are at, the guys who did first year correspondence, we're looking forward to getting to know people like yourselves down the front here, Poland and India. I don't know your names yet, but I just love it as we journey with you through this one, two, three years, whatever it takes. We just almost feel as though we're on this journey with you. And at graduation, man, we're giving you the biggest cheer because it's just such a, a joy to see you go through but, you know, we're going to be looking at a lot of things, and I can't sum it all up in one session, so we're going to use both of these sessions, so we'll have a part one and a part two. But before doing that, I also want to welcome those who are online. Can we all just warmly welcome those who are watching the stream just now? Thank you. I just pray that you can just feel every bit as part of this, being in the comfort of your own rooms or wherever you are right now, but please don't let any distance separate you from the blessing of God. In the spiritual realm, there's no distance. Amen. Amen. I just know we're in for a good time over the next couple of sessions this morning. As Ken says, it's an adventure and it's exciting. Indiana Jones has got nothing on Jesus. Amen. He really hasn't. You know, I, I love Indiana Jones movies and I love adventure movies, but I'll tell you, for the greatest adventure of all time, it has to be with Jesus. Amen. Amen. But you know, I got thinking and I was sharing this with my church yesterday morning when we all met. In Genesis chapter 21, uh, in verse 13, it's Abraham referring to Ishmael. And I don't, you can look there by all means and take notes because that's what good students do. But keep taking notes of the scriptures and just meditate upon them in your own time and at your own leisure. Please, if I start to speak too quick, then just tell me I'm speaking too quick. I've got an accent that's not from around here, but most of you have got an accent that's not from around here. So I'm in good company today. Somebody once told me when we were in Cambodia, Dorothy Newitt, who's a, a long-standing friend and supporter of Andrew's ministry, we were in Cambodia many, many years ago, and we had an afternoon off, and we were in this, what they call the Russian market, and it was incredibly busy. There was thousands of local people there, and I could see Susan disappearing on the horizon, and I'm thinking, she's going to get lost. If she doesn't watch what she's doing, she's going to get lost. So I shouted out, Susan, Susan, slow down, slow down. And back here, that means slow down. Back here, that means slow down. But in Scotland, slow down, slow down. Slow, that's good, slow down. There's a Scotsman inside there, slow down. A Cambodian pastor behind me says, Susan, slow down, Susan, slow down. <laughs> Dorothy, who's from around this area, she said, oh no, Pastor Nia, please, no Scots, English only. Don't speak Scots. The Scots murdered the English language. She said, I said, Dorothy, how can somebody from the Midlands tell me that the Scots murdered the English language? So hallelujah for the accents we have. But I've always maintained, and the students who have gone through all these years of college will know this story. But for those who don't know this story, let me tell you this. You remember the time in the, in the time of Babel, of Babel, where they started to build the tower? This is Poland and India I'm speaking to right now. What's your names? Ma oh, Magdalena. That was Susan's mother's name. Magdalena. Amit. Amit. Amit and Magdalena. Remember the time when they were building the Tower of Babel and they were getting in and doing things they shouldn't have been doing? Well, I remember, you know, God, well, did God show me? I've not yet found a scripture. So this is Johnology. Okay? But I'm convinced, you know, because we're not confusion all came down and all these different languages were birthed. Indian, Polish, Scots, English, all these different languages were birthed at that point. But I'm convinced that if they hadn't done what they had done, the whole world would be speaking Scots. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Isn't it good that all these different nations, you see, your nationality is not dependent upon the land of your birth. It's in the kingdom of God. We're citizens of heaven. You know, Ken, we, we don't want to know one another after the flesh. Ken's already said that. Believe you me, I've got a flesh. And you don't want to see it. But you know, we need to know one another after the spirit. 
You know, and that's why when I come to England, I become all things to all men, and that we might win some. So first and foremost, we're heaven's ambassadors. We're citizens of heaven. The flesh is Scottish. The flesh is Polish. The flesh is Indian. The flesh is wherever you come from. But we need to know one another after the Spirit. It's so important. You know, when you start seeing one another after, after, one another after the Spirit, you just see Jesus. That's Jesus sitting next to you, Bob. That's not Mary. That's Jesus sitting next to you. That's Jesus sitting behind you. That's Jesus sitting before you. Jesus is in this room right now through these dear saints. And when you start to see Jesus in others, that deals with personality clashes. That deals with self. I like what Wendell says. Wendell says, you know, you can't criticize when you're praying in tongues. You can't gossip when you're praying in tongues. You can't backbite and have opinions about somebody when you're praying in tongues. It's so simple. Romans 7, you'll see it. Romans 7 is life after the flesh. Romans 8 is all about living after the Spirit. Just turn the page. It's just a flip of the page to live in the Spirit. Too many of us want to dwell after the carnal man. But anyway, I started to think about Genesis 21, 13. And it says of Ishmael, and I, I, I've got, I believe it's a great teaching on Ishmael. And it's a teaching that nobody ever really else teaches on because we're told not to birth Ishmael's, right? We're told, oh, don't, birth, don't give birth to Ishmael. But Ishmael was blessed. Ishmael was blessed of God. And that gives me great encouragement because, well, sometimes I dip in the spirit and I dip in the flesh. I long to live in the spirit more and more and more and more and more. But I'm learning these things. And I don't know about you, but I'm not there yet. But he has begun a great work in me. He began the work. So let's not me and you interfere. Amen. Let's just him continue to do the work. But it says of uh, God was speaking to Abraham and he says, because he is your offspring. Because he is your offspring. Because he is your offspring, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless him. He's going to be blessed. And I started to think about Ishmael being Abraham's son. I'm thinking, man, what a blessing that must have been to be the son of Abraham. And then I started to think, well, hold on a minute. I'm a son of the Most High. I'm a co-heir right now with Jesus Christ. I'm seated in the heavenly realms with Jesus right now. And because I'm a son, I'm forgiven. Because I'm a son, I'm righteous. Because I'm a son, I'm restored. Because I'm a son, I'm a new creation. Because I'm a son, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because I'm a son, I'm chosen. Because I'm a son, I'm loved. Because I'm a son, I am in this world the same as Jesus. Starting to see that I'm a lot more blessed than Ishmael. Because I'm a son. I'm more than a conqueror. Because I'm a son, God is for me. Because I'm a son, I'm no longer the tail but the head. Because I'm a son, I can advance against the troop and I can scale a wall. Because I can, I'm a son, I can do what Jesus did. Because I'm a son, I have authority. Because I'm a son, I can command mountains into the sea. Because I'm a son, I'm blameless. Because I'm a son, I'm without fault before the throne of God. Because I'm a son, I have position. Because I'm a son, I'm precious. Because I'm a son, I'm highly favored. Because I'm a son, I'm well. Because I'm a son, I'm at peace. Because I'm a son, I can have joy at all times. Because I'm a son, I'm at one with God. Thanks be to Jesus. Because I'm a son, I want to be like my dad. My dad was a coal man. You young folks know what coal men wear. Coal men used to take bags of coal on their back and take them and deliver them to your house when your house was fueled by coal. And the only heating that you had in your home, I'm showing my age off, I'm not as old as Godfrey, but I'm showing my age off. <laughs> the only heating that was in your house was the coal fire in one room. You had metal frame windows 
all throughout the rest of the house. And I remember in the cold, frosty mornings, writing my name on the inside of my bedroom. On the inside of my bedroom, I wrote my name on the frost on the single pane glass windows. That's how old I am, Bob. Me, yeah, you, you too. <laughs> you know, my dad was a coal man. And I remember during the school holidays, the Thursday run was known as the country run. Dad would get the lorry loaded up with four or five bags of coal high. Now you see a coal lorry with one bag high. Change days, but these are the days in which I grew up. And uh, so I would go with my dad, and my dad would be invited into customers' houses for a cup of coffee when he was delivering the bags of coal. And I would never go in. I'd always use that as an excuse to jump up on the back of the coal wagon. And this lady came out with a bottle of Coca-Cola one day, and she says, here, son, what are you? And she looked at me, and she says, boy, she says, what on earth are you doing? And I was grabbing all the coal dust and all the coal stew, and I was putting it over my face. And I said to her, I says, I want to be like my dad. I want to be like my dad. And that's been my cry ever since I met Jesus on the 12th of August, 1988. I want to be like my dad. And because of my son, I want to be like my dad. Because of my son, I believe everything my father tells me. Hello? Hello? Do you hear that? Because of my son, I believe everything my father tells me. I don't doubt him. I don't question him. I just believe it. I've got three granddaughters. You've missed it. That was a chance for you to say, you're much too young to have three granddaughters. <laughs> I've got three granddaughters. The, the two youngest, uh, Felicity, she's eight. Hope, she's eight. And big sister, uh, Finley, she's, thir coming to, well, she's 13. And I remember when Finley was a wee girl. She's now 13 years old. When Finley was a wee girl, Papa spoke, she believed it. She took me at her word. She just, Papa spoke it, it was true. Never questioned it, never doubted it. Yes, Papa, that's right, Papa. She's, four, she's nearly 14. Papa speaks. How can that be? Is that right? Well, what she normally says when Papa speaks is, is that right, Gran? She looks for confirmation. She looks for aff affirmation. What is it about us as Christians? What is it about us as God's people that when you first get saved, you hear the Word of God and you think, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Why do we change when we grow up and we mature in the faith and think that we know a lot more than what God knows? And when God speaks to us, like Ken has been referring to this morning, when God speaks to us, the first thing we do is, how can that be? How does that work? Well, what does it matter that you know that it works or not? I want to get back to that, those childlike days in my faith where my dad spoke and I just believed it. Can you say Amen. Because there are many of us in here that are trying to work it out. And it won't work. It doesn't happen that way. It's called a, a faith walk. And it's just as you go, revelation comes. And you walk in the revelation that you're walking in at that time. It's like if I had a torch right now and I was shining a torch on the palm of my hand, right close up there's a small circle of light. And that's what revelation's like. You walk in that light that you understand and that has been revealed to you. But God on the journey starts to lift the torch up. And the circle of light gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's what it's all about. You just walk in, walk in what you know. It's what you know that sets you free. I gave up debating years ago. And when people try and, people try and get me back into debating, I just walk out and leave the room. Because most of the time they're discussing things they've not got a clue about. But I want to talk about what I know. I can encourage you with what I know. Not what I don't know. It's the truth that you know that sets you free. Amen? Amen. So let's not worry about what we don't know. And let's concentrate on what we do know. And when we concentrate on that, God will lift the light. God will lift the torch. And before you know it, you're thinking, how did I know all these things? Well, you just kept walking. You just kept following Jesus. He didn't know a couple of weeks ago he was going to be the interim director of this, ministry, of this school. He just kept following Jesus. Somebody once said to me, he said, Pastor, what's, what's your plans and purposes for the church? What's your plans for the church? And I looked at this individual and I went, I don't have one. And this person looked at me and they went, praise God. And then she went, I think. And then I said to her, well, I says, let, let me explain just a bit more fully. I says, 
I don't have plans as such what, what's the program we're doing in two months' time and three months' time and where we're going to be in six months' time. I don't have that agenda. I don't have that plan. My plan is you. My plan is you. Because you see, ministry is not about ministry. Ministry is about you. Ministry is about people. If I can look after people, if I can love on people, and if I can take care of people, the ministry takes care of itself. This ministry is not about the ministry. And God forbid it will never be a business. It will never be a business. It's about you. Because you've got gifts and talents inside you that only you can bring to the table. I can't do what you can do and I don't want to do what you can do, but I can do what I can do and I will function in that office. And I will bring to the table what I can bring. Psalmist says that God sets the lonely in families. God sets the lonely in families. Well, John, I'm not lonely. I've got a good bunch of friends. I've got a good crowd of people around about me. I'm not lonely, so that doesn't pertain to me. That's not real to me. Yes, it is. Because when you take that word lonely back into the Hebrew, it means unique. God sets the unique in families. Because the thing is, I don't want you to be me. I don't want me to be you because only you can bring to the table what you can bring to the table. And it's vital that you get set free and released into these things that God has called you to do. Well, I had young folks in the church with a ministry of dance. I've got two left feet. I love a Scottish Cayley. I can do that stuff. <laughs> I've got two left feet as a dancer, but these guys were leading us in a ministry of dance. I can't do that. But they brought it to the table. What are you bringing to the table? What unique quality have you got? Why would you want to be like anybody else? You're totally unique. You're wonderfully and fearfully made. Why would you want to be like somebody else? So to finish this, we, because I'm a son... I believe everything my father tells me. There's joy in my heart, peace in my mind, and health to my body. Because I'm a son, I'm content. Because I'm a son, my father wants me to receive my full inheritance. That's his desire for me. Amen. And I truly believe that. Now, we'll get on to where we're going. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, this is... Plant a seed, sow a seed. Is there a difference? No? I, I'm just asking, I don't know. I thought you might have had revelation, Lucy. So we're planting, we're sowing seed. And I praise God that, that you guys are good, rich, fertile soil. Why else would you be here? Why else would you be considering what you're doing. You're, you're the old film, uh, what do you call it? The Prime of Miss Jean Brody, for those who are old enough to remember that, she said of her girls, she says, my girls are the creme de la creme. My girls are the creme de la creme. Well, God right now is showing me creme de la creme. Don't exclude yourself from that. You are the creme de la creme. 25 to 11, 12 already. Again, you took up too much of my time. Hallelujah. Creme de la creme. I remember flying out one time from, from Venice Airport. It was a nighttime flight. And as we flew up and started to fly over Venice, Susan was looking out the window. I don't know how she manages it, but Susan always manages to get the window seat. But she was looking out, the, looking out the window and she said, wow, look at all the lights. And instantly the Holy Spirit said to me, John, that's what I say every day. Wow, look at all the lights. That's what God says about you. Wow, look at all the lights. But you know, when we look at the life of the disciples, after Pentecost, after Pentecost, because those guys were radically changed. I just shared with the staff the other day, I find it amazing that Jesus washed these, the disciples' feet. These same guys, he washed their feet 
knowing full well that every one of them would disown him. Not just Thomas. Every one of them would walk away from him. Every one of them would deny him. Every one would turn their back on him. And yet Jesus, knowing that, still washed their feet. Because you see, Jesus saw beyond the cross. He saw the day of Pentecost coming. That comforter that he spoke of and he said to his disciples, it's best for you that I go. Then another comforter shall come. I can't compute that. I really feel such compassion sometimes for the disciples because these guys are working this all out with their brain. And sometimes we, filled with the Holy Ghost, still try and work things out with our brain. Well, it cannot be fathomed out by this brain. They're spiritually discerned. It's spiritually revealed. It's revealed by the Holy Ghost. But can you imagine Jesus saying to you, after you faithfully walking side by side for three and a half years, it's best for you now that I go? I struggle with that. I really struggle with that. I'd be the first to argue. I'd be the first to discuss. I'd be, what do you mean it's best that you go? This has been the best three and a half years of my life and you're saying it's best that I you go? Man, I'd been holding on to him as, as hard as I could and trying to persuade him and rebuking him, saying, get behind me, Satan. I'd be doing all of these things to try and keep Jesus there. <coughs> Excuse me. But here he is saying it's best that I go. And I love it how he says, another comforter, another that means that one's going, another one's coming. And that is the one who transformed the lives of these disciples. And that is the one who's transforming the lives of each and every one in this room and those listening online. It's a work done by the Holy Ghost, transforming and changing lives. Jesus knew everyone would disown him. Everyone would deny him. Yet still he washed their feet. What's Jesus shown us through that? He's shown me, he's shown us, and he's shown you that Jesus' loyalty to us isn't dependent upon my loyalty to him. He's going to be loyal to me regardless of whether I'm loyal to him or not. That's incredible, church. And we need to take that on board, that I'm going to be loyal to Bob, I'm going to be loyal to Mary, I'm going to be loyal to Godfrey, I'm going to be loyal to you regardless of your loyalty towards me. That's hard. Because when somebody's disloyal to you, when somebody upsets you, when somebody offends you, and that's another teaching altogether, the first thing we want to do is strike back. Well, Jesus washed their feet. That's the calling. That's the calling that's upon our lives. Not to be offended. We'll teach on that, I'm sure, when we're down in the school at some point. You know, it's wrong for me to offend you but it's also a sin for you to be offended. Another teaching for another day. But we're going to see that these guys were wonderfully transformed, totally transformed due to the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Peter became what we all desire to become. Peter became like Jesus. I've asked this many times of all the students, and I've gave you the answer already, but if I was to say to you, who raised the dead? Who walked on water? Who healed the sick? who sometimes withdrew to quiet places to pray, you would instantly say, Jesus, but Peter did all of these things. Peter did all of these things. Peter became what we are attaining to become. He became like Jesus. And that's, I believe that's your goal. I believe that's your heart's cry, that you long to become like Jesus. Well, here's the truth in Romans chapter 8, living by the Spirit, you're already like him. God's working on this other part of us. Let me very quickly, for the second and third years, and for staff who've seen this before, just bear with me for one minute. Sir, please come and stand beside me very quickly. Very quickly. That's quick as you can go, good lad. There you go. We'll have you there. Susan, you just come very quickly into here. What's your name, my brother? Barry. Barry. Hallelujah. So we've got Susan... We've got Barry. Who have we got? Susan and Barry. Who have we got? Wrong. You. This is you. Who's this? This is you. 
This is Jesus, and Barry all of a sudden thinks he's got the greatest job. But I'm God. <laughs> so we've got God, Jesus, you. Colossians 3 tells us that we are hidden in Christ. Hidden in Christ. Hidden in Jesus Christ. You are hidden in Jesus Christ. And as you stand before the throne of God this morning, all God looks at is one who is holy, one who is pure, one who is righteous, one who is without sin, one who is without blame, one who is faultless. And that is how Jesus, God the Father, views you through Jesus. Thank Amen. you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, you. That is how he views you. And that is some of what this school, this ministry will teach you about who you are in him. And there's a lot more to that teaching than what I've just shown you there. But you are hidden in Christ. And that is the identity that we need to start putting on. And that's what brings about the change. It's the renewing of the mind according to Hebrews 12. Renew the mind. We need to, when God says it, when God speaks to us like Ken says, we believe it. We don't be like my 13-year-old granddaughter who says, can that be right? How's that work? Well, she needs to go back to what she was like when she was three, four, five, six years old. Papa spoke, she believed. Church, as we grow in our faith, it's the old preacher's message. I'm not asking you to be childish, but to be childlike. And that's, these are the days we need to go back to, the basics of Christianity, of just hearing Dad speak and believing that it's true. But Peter became like Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we all know it. Well, I don't believe we all know it. I believe that most of us have got a knowledge of it, but we don't know it. There's a difference between having a knowledge and knowing. You don't really know me, you have a knowledge of me. The Pharisees had a knowledge of Jesus. The Sadducees had a knowledge of Jesus. The scribes had a knowledge of Jesus, but they didn't know him. And there are many in Christendom who have a knowledge of Jesus, but they don't know him. We don't know him, but 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if anyone in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. And the new has come. The new has come. I love it back in my own hometown. I, I was born in that town. So I've been in that town for 58 years. So, but I've been a Christian now for, uh, I, I don't know, 30, many years, 20, 28 years, something like that. And I love it. I'm born and bred in that town. Uh, back home we would say, I'm a wheel Kent face. Wheel Kent means well known. I'm a well known face, known by everybody. And I love it when people who I used to go to the bars and the pubs and the football and all these things with, I go up to them and say, hey, how you doing, Barry? I'm John Donnelly. And they look at me as if I've got horns on my head and they say, what do you mean you're John Donnelly? We know who you are. We've known you all our lives. No, 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 no. That was the old me, Barry. This is a brand spanking you, John Donnelly, by the grace of God standing before you. And I introduced them to the new me. They think I'm off my head. I don't care. I'd rather be off my head for Jesus than be a fool in the world. Hallelujah. They, they can't comprehend. But you know what? I've got guys coming up to me and saying to me, secretly, they come up Nicodemus like, hey, what happened? I can see the change. I can see the transformation. It's taken them 28 years to come and ask the question. But you know, if you keep walking... You walk into the things of God. You don't have to plan it. You don't have to engineer it. You just keep following Jesus. Amen. We need to understand that the new creation, that the new creation has received the nature and life of Jesus, of the Father and our spirits. And we invite the Holy Spirit who has imparted to us the new nature from the Father to come into our body and make his home in us, that as we begin to feed on the word, to practice the word, and to live the word, and he builds that word into us. And I just think it's incredible that the very genius of God is his ability to build 
himself into us through his word so that in our daily walk we live like Jesus. I think that's pure genius by God how he's able to do that. The Bible says, I know you know this, in Hebrews 1.3 that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and he's the exact representation of his being. And I just love it, you know, Jesus said himself, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So if we want a true image, an exact image of what God the Father is like, we just simply look to Jesus. Jesus has always got to be our example in life. Always got to be our example in life. We need to remember also that Jesus is just like you and me. Jesus had a flesh. We forget that. We sometimes think, oh, well, he, he was Jesus. He could do these things. You know, everything that Jesus ever did whilst he was here on earth, he did it as a man filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm going over here. They listen better over here. Everything that Jesus ever done, everything he ever did, he did it as a man filled with the Holy Ghost. I see a lot of people sitting here, men and women, filled with the Holy Ghost. What's stopping us? What's between our ears? That's the problem. We try and reason it. We try and question it. We try and work it out. A man once told me, he says, John, the mind is the dark room where you develop the negatives. And the younger ones are thinking, develop negatives? What's develop negatives? Well, in days gone by, you had cameras with film. No, I'm not going into that today. Now it's all digital. But the mind is the dark room where you develop the negatives. Well, if that's true, and it is, there's also a part of that mind and that brain that can develop the positives. And I flicked that round a few years ago. It was good counsel that pastor gave me, but there was also a flip side to it, which he never told me, and the Holy Spirit showed me. Well, you can develop the things of my kingdom. You can develop my thoughts. You know, the scripture says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways, but I truly believe that God wants them to be. He wants my thoughts to be his thoughts. He wants my ways to be his ways. How do I do that? By living in the Spirit by following Jesus, by walking closely with him. But he also, you know, Jesus wasn't a robot. He wasn't programmed from heaven. You know that Jesus had a will? Jesus had a will all of his own. And that will had to come into the submission of the Father's will. Remember the time in Gethsemane? Well, there he was, praying for his life. He even cried out, Lord, if, just take this cup from me. Take this, take this task away from me. But then he says, but, not my will be done, but yours. Jesus' will had to come into submission of the Father's. The exact same as us. For a brief moment, there was a battle of wills going on in the Garden of Gethsemane. The will of God and the will of Jesus. Take this cup from me. He was crying out, take this cup from me. We don't know the anguish. We'll never know the pain, the torment, the struggle, the demonic voices going on at that time. We don't know. We can only try and read between the lines. We don't know. Scripture doesn't really highlight it nor bring it out. But Jesus was having a struggle in the garden. But then he submitted his will. And brothers and sisters, we have to submit our wills to the will of the Father. And you will have struggles. And you will have resistances. And you will have fights. But you know, we need to come to that point of submission and yielding. And say the words of Jesus, Father, not my will be done, yours. And when we get to that point, watch God do amazing things. Jesus said, we have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. Christian life's not easy, church not a picnic, it's not a bed of roses. I know that everybody in this room will know that. 
but I love John 16, 33. You need to look out for the good buts in the Bible. There's a lot of good buts in the Bible. I remember saying that in America and the whole place burst out laughing. I looked at Susan and I said, did I say something wrong? I suddenly realized they called their butt. They're behind their butt. There's a lot of good butts in the Bible. <laughs> Just clean your mind up. <laughs> There's a lot of great butts in the Bible. In this world, you will have trouble. But, I love the amplified of that verse. In John 16, 33, it says, In this world, you will have trouble. You will have distress. You will have frustration. But, be of good cheer. Be certain. Be undaunted. For I have overcome the, the world of power. I have overcome the world and have deprived it of power to harm you. Hallelujah. That's a great but. It really is. And that's what we need to keep focused on. We need to keep focused on the truth, not on the circumstances of life. I'm not saying to ignore your struggles. I'm not saying to ignore the difficulties that you're going through. But you can take these struggles, you can take these hard things of life to the throne of God. And you're taking it to somebody much bigger than that difficulty that you're going through. God, the God, the God who calmed the seas, the God who stilled the winds, He's still alive. And He's still speaking to your storms. He's actually encouraging you to speak to your storms. Hallelujah. God is love. He is love. And we are to walk in love as Christ walked in the love toward the world. The Father so loved the world that He gave His only Son. And Jesus so loved the world that He gave Himself. And now we so love the world. Ouch. That we give ourselves. That's Christ-like. Paul is another who reproduced Jesus, just like Peter did. There he is along with Silas, beaten, flogged, locked up in jail, hands in the stocks, feet in the stocks. In the midst of torture and agony, they begin to praise God. <laughs> that has to be a work of the Holy Ghost. They begin to praise God. They choose, they choose to praise God. You know, to rejoice is a choice. To rejoice is a choice. You can either be grumpy or you can be happy. You choose. You make the choices. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end result is death, the Proverbs tells us. And many of us are choosing the road of death. Maybe not intentionally, but we do. But they made a decision of their wills. They made a decision of their wills, Paul and Silas, to praise God. They were set free, and not only them. Turn with me. Where are we? Seven minutes. Turn with me to Acts chapter 16. Acts the 16th chapter. We're in a Bible school, so we better open up our Bibles. Or whatever electronic gadget you're addicted to, so... Acts, the 16th chapter. And it says in verse 26, Suddenly there was a violent, such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. Everybody's chains came loose. Here's the thing. There are still many Christians sitting on the jail floor. And you know when, for as long as you're sitting there, and for as long as you're still in that position of sitting, those chains are still around you. And you don't know you're free. I find it remarkable that in every miracle that Jesus ever done, or every miracle we see being done in the book of Acts by the disciples, by the church, there was action on behalf of the one who was receiving the miracle. They had to get up from that jail floor. Peter had to get up from that jail floor, and then when he get up, the chains fall off. But for as long as you're sitting, you still think you're chained up. Most people know in this, in this school, they know, my, they know all about my wee budgery guy. As a wee boy, I had a budgie, a pet budgie called Peter. And he was a great wee budgie. 
I had him speaking. My, my, my local football team is Queen of the South. Queen of the who, you all say? Queen of the South is my local football team. Hey, they're the only team that's mentioned in the Bible, I'll have you know. The scripture says the Queen of the South shall rise again. So let me tell you, we're waiting for Queen of the South to rise again. But anyway, that's another story. But Peter would say things like, Peter's a bonny boy, he's a wee kiss, up the queens. He would say loads of things. He would just keep talking to me. But Peter had the wrong call in life. He couldn't fly. He was useless. I don't know why he was a budgie. I don't know why he was a bird. I would, I would open up the cage door and he wouldn't come out. I'd have to put my hand in, bring him out of the cage and throw him up towards the living room ceiling. And he would fly for half a lap around the living room. And then he would land on the carpet and walk everywhere. <laughs> he walked everywhere. I, I'm thinking, why is this bird a bird? He doesn't like to fly. I'm thinking, I wish I was a bird. I would fly. But he just walked everywhere. But here's the thing. The, the cage door for Peter was wide open for him to come out. And he would come out, but he would just stand at the edge of the door and sing a wee song and go back in. I would go in and flow, throw him out into the open space. How many in the church are still sitting in the prison floor? How many are waiting for the hand of Jesus to go in there and throw you out? It's not going to happen. You're going to have to have a part to play in your miracle. It's called getting up from where you are and moving into the things. And when you start to move into these things of God, the chains fall off you, hallelujah. They really do, church. Stop sitting like a prisoner. Stop having this, this victim mentality. Jesus has set you free. And that truth that you know will truly set you free. And take note of what happens here. Hallelujah. Time is going good, church. God's the redeemer of the time. All the doors were opened up. A jailer and his household hear the good news of Jesus and are saved. And if Paul had had any other spirit, he could never have done it. But Paul had become like Jesus. He had become like his master. He gave himself up to the lordship of love. And as God was reproducing himself in Paul, he wants to do that in me and in you. He wants to reproduce himself in you. And look what it says now in the scripture about the jailer washing his wounds in verse 33. Verse 33. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Underline that. This is important and this is imperative. Why you need to walk in a spirit of forgiveness towards them that have offended you. Because this jailer, maybe we don't know if he personally afflicted their backs with the lashes, with the wounds. We don't know that. But we can safely and confidently say, well, he gave the order for that to happen. He may well have beaten them up as well. We don't know. He may well have got that tuppence worth of kicking them as well when they were down there. Such was the treatment for Christians in that time and, in, and indeed the days in which we're living in now. But look at how the scripture tells us that the jailer washed his wounds. The one who had maybe inflicted these wounds to the backs of Paul and Silas or maybe upon his orders that they were beaten and flogged is now being used by God to bring soothing. He's now being used by God to bring healing and bring comfort to their aching bodies. Why am I telling you this before the break? I'm telling you this. Because there are people in your life that maybe have offended you. Maybe they've upset you. Maybe they've wronged you. But what's to stop God turning the thing around? And for these same people that God can now use to come and bless you. That's why you need to have such compassion on people and grace upon people who are saying wrong things about you. When we went through a tough, a tough time in our church a number of years ago and wrong things were being said and accusations were being thrown at us that we knew were not true, we were desperate to get out there and tell the truth. God said, John and Susan, shut up, keep a dignified silence. We said nothing. We didn't try to defend ourselves because he is our great defender. He is our great defender. Church, if you will just trust him, he will turn these things around their head. He will use your enemies to heal your wounds. Cambodia and Vietnam have been at war and are even at war to this very day. And I find it interesting and amazing that in 1975, in the mid-1970s, it was the Vietnamese, 
the enemies of the Cambodians who were used to liberate the people of Cambodia from the regime of Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge. He used their enemies to set them free. Think about it the next time you want to respond. It's break time. It's 12 o'clock on the dot. We all have 10 minutes, my brother. So we're back in the auditorium for 10 past 12 promptly. Amen.